For this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at something that is related to quadratic equations. We're going to be working with quadratic equations, and we're going to be solving quadratic equations. So what I'm going to do is start off with just having you think about the simplest quadratic equation, which would be y equals x squared. Now when I say quadratic equation, that means it's going to be in the form something equals something. It's going to involve a quadratic, in this case x to the power 2. And in general with these things, you're going to be asked to solve. Now in this case, y equals x squared, we're asking ourselves, what value of x can I square so that I get y? And the way that you, the way that you would solve this in this form is you would take the square root of both sides. But because you don't know whether or not the value of x is positive or negative, and the, the reason for that is, let's say that the answer to this was x equal 3. So what is x squared? In that case, x squared is equal to 9. So that means that y could be equal to 9. But what if x was negative 3? Negative 3, all squared, is also equal to 9. So if this were the equation, 9 equals x squared, we would actually have two candidates for the value of x we would have plus 3 and minus 3 as possibilities. So we always need to keep that in mind. So there's the first thing. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is the fact that once we start working with actual numeric values, we might end up with values that are not going to result in integer values when we take a square root. For example, we might get the square root of 5, and there's nothing we can do without resorting to our calculator to make that any simpler. We might end up with some more complex numbers that are combined. So this one has an integer value 3, and then under the radical sign we have a square root of 2. And we could have fractions as well, or any combination of these things. As we move forward with this course, more and more often you're going to be asked to provide your answers and to work with expressions that are in exact forms. So I know that there's a lot of calculator dependence out there, but this is one of those things you just need to practice. You need to force yourself to develop whatever level of comfort that you can with the idea of working with expressions, working with answers that may contain radicals, may contain fractions, may contain both. Okay, so if we're going to work with radicals, we need to make sure we understand what the different terms are, just in case they come up. And really, there's not a lot to discuss here. There's the index of the radical. That is the number that appears here. Now, you'll notice in this first case, there is no number. The number is understood to be 2. So that is the square root of 5. Over here, I have the cube root of 5. And in that case, you must write the 3. So just like if I have x, it's not required for me to say there's one x there. It is understood that when no coefficient, when there is no leading coefficient, it is understood to be 1. Well, the same thing is true that if no index is specified on the radical, it is understood to be the index of 2 or the square root. Whatever is underneath the radical sign is known as the radicand. This is not going to come up a great deal as a term, but in this lesson it will, and just for being precise about what we're referring to, when we're referring to the thing under the radical sign, or are we referring to the entire radical itself? So the radicand is the thing that you are taking the square root of, or the cube root of. Okay, so the rule for multiplying and dividing radicals is if you take the product of two radicals with the same index, it's important that they actually have the same index. So I'm going to add that here. If you have the product of two radicals with the same index, that is the same as the radical or the root of the products. And this works either way. So if I started with the square root of xy, or actually let's make it more interesting, let's make it the cube root of xy, that would become the cube root of x 
times the cube root of y. And you wouldn't necessarily do either of these two things. You would do whichever of these two things was most useful for you, depending on the situation you were in. The same thing is true for division. So if I have the square root of a over the square root of b, I can reform that into a single fraction, square root of a over b, or if I had the square root of x over y, I could, for convenience, I could break that into the square root of x over the square root of y, keeping the index of the radical the same. So in this case, I've written something that's hopefully quite clear to you. We could multiply this out. 4 times 9 is 36, but that's not the point of this exercise. So we could do this. We could write this as the square root of 36. And you might recognize that, well, 6 times 6 is 36. So the answer to that is 6. When we're taking the radical of a, of a value, when the question comes with the radical already formed, we assume we're taking the positive root or the positive square root in this case. That's why I only got an answer of positive 6. The only time we are going to be introducing the plus minus is going to be when we have a situation where we start with a quadratic equation and we have to use a square root. We introduce the square root ourselves in order to find our answer. Whenever we introduce the square root ourselves from outside, then we have to introduce the plus minus. Okay, so back to our example here. So this is one way to do it. But another way to do it would actually be to write this as the square root of 4 multiplied by the square root of 9. So here I have the product of 4 times 9 under the square root. So I'm going to actually write that as two separate products. The square root of 4 is equal to 2. The square root of 9 is equal to 3. And then 2 times 3 is equal to 6. N both of these are perfectly good in this case because we're just dealing with numeric values. In this case, the intention of this question is to just to show you that the square root of the fraction 16 over 9 is the same as the square root of 16 divided by the square root of 9. The square root of 16 is 4. The square root of 9 is 3. If you saw this and wanted to go straight to that answer, that would be perfectly fine. You recognize that the square root in this case applies to the numerator and denominator. So the square root of the numerator is 4, the square root of the denominator is 3, and we keep the fraction structure that was already there. Now, quite often you're going to be asked to keep your answers in an exact form, but you're also going to be asked to simplify. So there are some conventions that we follow when we talk about the simplest form of a radical. One of those rules is that the radicand, which is whatever's under the radical, in this case the number 8 is the radicand, has no perfect square factors other than 1. Now what does that mean? Think about how to factor 8. 8 is actually equal to, now you can, you can there's a number of ways that you can factor 8, but I chose a simple, of, a simple enough number here so that we could think of 8 as being 4 times 2. But 4 is actually a perfect square. 4 is actually 2 squared. And then that's also times 2 to make 8. So you can see this is a perfect square factor. Now, what happens if we take the square root of this whole thing? And the square root of 2 squared is just the integer value 2. And the square root of 2 to the power 1 stays inside the radical. So we end up with 2 root 2. In this case, another simplified form is you want no fractions for your final form of your radical. Now in this case, again, I'm giving you pretty easy examples. The square root of 5 over 4, so this has a fraction as the radicand. We don't want that. So the first thing we do is we actually split it using the rule from the previous page. So root 5 over root 4. And in this case it turns out, I chose this to be relatively straightforward. The square root of 4 is 2, so we end up with root 5 over 2. This is now the simplest form of this radical. If we have a radical left over in the denominator, in this case 2 root 3, the way that we get rid of the square root of 3 in the denominator 
is we are going to multiply by that same radical. So I'm going to multiply both top and bottom. I've already mentioned in class that there is a powerful technique that we use in math, which is that we can multiply anything by 1. Root 3 over root 3 is simply equal to 1. So this piece, it looks different, but it's really just multiplying by 1. And of course, 2 over root 3 times 1, I haven't changed anything. But by writing, by writing the number 1 in this form, root 3 over root 3, what I'm doing is I'm actually just manipulating this into a form that I prefer. Now, why does this work? Why is this useful? The numerator becomes 2 root 3. That's not particularly helpful. But the denominator becomes root 3 times root 3, which is actually the same as the square root of 9. And so we end up with 2 root 3 over, but the square root of 9 is a perfect square. That's why we have to multiply by the same radical. And so this ends up being 2 root 3 over 3, which is our final answer. If you can see it, going straight to the final answer when it's in a simple form like this is perfectly fine. Okay, some examples to go through. There's a couple of ways for probably for every single one of these to do this. I'm going to show you the long way. I'm not going to do the long way for all of them, but I'm going to show you the long way for this first one. Let's say that factoring is really not your strength. Well, then what you want to do is just look at what, what could I possibly factor out of 32. So even if you're not very good at factoring, I would expect that you can at least recognize that 32 is divisible by 2. So I'm going to write that as 2 times something. And in this case, that's going to be 2 times 16. Now, I'm going to leave that 2 times there, but now how can I write 16? Well, I recognize that 16 is divisible by 2, so I'm going to write that as 2 times 2 times 8. And I'm going to go through this process 2 times 2, and now what's 8? 8 is 2 times 4, 2 times 2 times 2 times, and now 4 I recognize is 2 times 2. And now, if you have to do it this way, if your factoring skills require you to do this kind of one very simple piece at a time, you now recognize that every pair of these is a perfect square. So 2 times 2 is 2 squared. 2 times 2 is 2 squared. And that means that I can take the square root of that and bring it outside, which is 2. And I can bring the square root of that which is 2 outside. 2 times 2 becomes 4 outside of the radical sign. And then what's left inside the radical sign is just 2. So root 32 in its simplest form is 4 root 2. A little bit more quickly, hopefully most of you would be here already. And if not, you're going to have to put in some practice to streamline this process for you. 2 stays on the outside. To simplify a radical, we never want to bring the integer value inside. There may be times when we bring the integers in for other reasons, but not to simplify. And then I recognize that 75 is actually 25 times 3, which is 2 root 25 times root 3. You don't need to do this step. But root 25 is actually 5 times root 3. Again, you don't need to do this step. And then 2 times 5 is 10 root 3. And if you recognize it, there is nothing wrong with going straight to that answer. But you do need to be able to do this. You need to be able to show this if I request it. I'm aware that some of you have calculators that also will do this for you. So don't be surprised if I ask you to do some simple questions like this without a calculator or showing me all the steps to show me you understand it or I could do something in between where I give you a calculator for the arithmetic add subtract multiply divide but that's it that's all you're allowed to use so it would be a calculator that I might provide negative 3 root 8 well we've already looked at root 8 so the negative 3 don't forget a negative sign in front just means multiplying by negative 1 negative 3 root 8 well, the root 8 is the same as 2 root 2. And then negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. 
and then the root 2 as before. 1 half times the square root of 72 over 25. That's 1 half times the square root of 72 on top, the square root of 25 on the bottom. The denominator is actually quite easy to deal with here because that's 2 and the square root of 25 is just 5. 1, I'm not even going to bother continuing to write 1. 1 times root 72 is just root 72, but I recognize that root 72 is actually 36 times 2. The square root of 36 is 6, leaving me with a square root of 2 in the numerator, over, now I could have, and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and simplify this as 6 root 2 over 10, but I'm going to also recognize that the number 2 divides into 6 3 times, and divides into 10 five times, and so I end up with my final answer is actually 3 root 2 over 5. Now, what if we're not dealing with multiplication or division? What if we have addition or subtraction? The only way that you can combine terms with addition and subtraction is if the radicands are the same. So in a more complicated case like B, you might have to simplify the radicals just so that you can identify which ones are the same radicand. And you're going to see that when we do the B example. But for now, for example, we've got root 3 and root 3, and we have root 5 and root 5. This expression would be no different than if I said let x equal root 3 and y equal root 5. I could rewrite this as 4x minus 2y plus 6x plus 5y and 4x plus 6x is 10x minus 2y plus 5y is plus 3y and then I could just revert that so that's 10 times root 3 plus 3 times root 5. And that, of course, is our actual answer here. 4 root 3 plus 6 root 3 is 10 root 3. Negative 2 root 5 plus 5 root 5 is plus 3 root 5. The second example is a little bit more complicated, not terribly so, but it's got a little bit more to it. What we need to do is we need to rewrite these. I'm not going to skip over all the steps, but I'm not going to write it in the same level of detail as I did before. So 2 times the square root of 12. Well, there's a perfect square in there. It's 4. So 12 is 4 times 3. I'm going to write out the perfect squares for you. 5 and 27 is 9 times 3 plus 3 and 48. This one you might want to do some work at the side, a little bit of rough work depending on how good your multiplication tables are. This one is 16 times 3. The square root of 4 is 2, so 2 comes out times 2, 2 times 2 is 4, root 3, minus. The square root of 9 is 3, 5 times 3 is 15. We keep that negative sign times the square root of 3 plus 3 times the square root of 16. The square root of 16 is 4. 3 times 4 is 12 times the square root of 3. And now we end up with 4 minus 15. So that's going to be, and these are all root 3's. This is like 4x minus 15x plus 12x. So 4 root 3 minus 15 root 3 is negative 11 root 3 negative 11 root 3 plus 12 root 3 is going to be positive 1 root 3 but we don't normally write plus 1 as a coefficient so we would just write that as root 3 as our final answer. Now in this case all of them ended up having a simplified form of root 3 but that may not be the case. You can end up with these separate terms as well. Okay just like and it's kind of like what I said before no different than if I gave you the binomial expansion of 3x plus 2 and 2x minus 3, 
you would use the distributive property or you would use a, a shortcut like FOIL to do this. We are going to do the exact same thing here and we will use, in this case we'll use FOIL just to help us remember the order to do this expansion. So we're going to start with the first terms. 3 root 5 times 2 root 5. Multiply the integer parts first. 3 times 2 is 6. And then multiply the radicals but keep them in the radical. 5 times 5 is 25 but it's going to be the root of 25. Now let's do the outer part. That would be 3 root 5 times negative 3. So positive times a negative. 3 times 3 is 9 and there's no radical part here so we treat it just like the number 1 so that just leaves us with negative 9 root 5. Now we do the inner terms 2 times 2 root 5 it's going to be positive 4 root 5 and then the last terms positive 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Now in this case because the radicands are the same we actually get this interesting effect on the first term. The square root of 25 is a perfect square, it's actually 5. So 6 times 5 is equal to 30. Negative 9 root 5 plus 4 root 5 gives me overall a negative 5 root 5, minus 6 on the end. I could have done the 30 minus 6 in the first step, that would have been fine, but I'm going to do it in the second, so 30 minus 6 is equal to 24 minus 5 root 5. It is also perfectly fine and there are actually some cases where you're going to want to write it this way. Um, it would be fine to write this as negative 5 root 5 plus 24. In this case there's no particularly good reason to write one or the other uh, but there are cases where we might want to write it this way. If this was your final answer to a question, this would absolutely be fine. Okay, now the idea of rationalizing the denominator. When we are putting our radical into a simplest form, we're not always going to have situations, for example, like this, where the denominator might just contain a single radical, or the example I gave here, where the denominator contained a single radical. In this case, the denominator contained a single radical. I was able to, able to multiply quite easily to get rid of the radical. Essentially, I moved it from the denominator to the numerator. If the denominator is a little bit more complex, there is still a process where we can do that. And it is multiplying by the conjugate of the denominator. It's not quite as simple, but it's it still follows a pretty simple rule so long as you remember it and so long as you're comfortable with the algebra. So if the denominator or if we just have a binomial term with a radical in it, if it's in the form a root b plus c root d, the conjugate always involves writing out the exact same thing except for you're going to change the sign between them. It doesn't matter the order they're in so long as your conjugate preserves the same order. So if it was, in this case, a root b minus c root d, I would multiply by the conjugate, which would be a root b plus c root d. So just to make sure that's clear, if I want to, and actually I don't want to say that's equal to, what I want to say here is the conjugate of this is going to be root 5 plus root 2. The conjugate of this second one, 3 root 5, I write the first term, I could do it this way as well, 2 root 10, and then the plus becomes a minus. Now this is a useful skill, and if you need to recognize this, if you need some practice on this, you can let me know. But really it's the application of this that's more important, which is when we're trying to rationalize the denominator. So here is an example of rationalizing the denominator. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to recognize, okay, the denominator is equal to root 3 minus root 2. That means that the conjugate is equal to root 3 plus root 2.
And so now I'm going to multiply top and bottom by root 3 plus root 2 over root 3 plus root 2. And once again, we're using that mathematical trick or tool where I can multiply anything by 1 and not actually change it. All I'm doing is changing its form. I'm changing how it looks. Now to do this, I still, what I do is I treat the numerator as a binomial expansion, multiply out those brackets. I treat the denominator like a, so I'll do this and I'll keep the colors here. So using FOIL, 4 root 3 times root 3 is 4 root 9. And if you can see this and do the mental math, you should feel free, but I'm going to write out all the steps. Now, that's first. Outer, 4 root 3 times positive root 2 is going to be plus 4 root 6, because root 3 times root, th root 2 is root 6. The inner terms, negative 2 root 2 times root 3 is negative 2 root 6, and negative 2 root 2 times positive root 2 is negative 2 root 4. Now I will do that denominator in a different color but I'm going to do the binomial expansion now on those sets of brackets and you'll see something very interesting occurs here. F uh, first root 3 times root 3 is root 9. Outer root 3 times positive root 2 is plus root 6. Inner negative root 2 times root 3 is minus root 6 and last, negative root 2 times positive root 2 is negative root 4. And hopefully you can see here that that is just going to be equal to 0. Positive root 6 minus root 6 is equal to 0. And one, going one step further, you might have noticed that this denominator was in the form a minus b, a plus b, which is a difference of squares expansion, so that's just going to be a squared minus b squared. The middle term is 0, and that's what happened here. Now, simplifying, 4 times root 9 is actually 4 times 3, which is 12. 4 root 6 minus 2 root 6 is plus 2 root 6. 2 times root 4 is actually 2 times 2. Square root of 4 is 2, so this is minus 4. Over. Square root of 9 is 3. This is 0 in the middle, minus the square root of 4, which is 2. So I end up with 12 minus 4, which is 8, plus 2 root 6 over 1. But of course, we don't normally express a denominator of 1. That's just 8 plus 2 root 6. And that's our final answer. And that is it for this lesson. There's a lot of little things to take in there. But taken individually, no one of those pieces, I hope at least, is beyond your ability to learn. And if you have difficulty with it, please make sure you come in and see me.